Uh, first off, my name is Dan Houchins. I've been involved in leather working for about 20 years. Um, didn't get involved in armor making until about four years ago and didn't really get interested in accurate historic armor until about oh, maybe nine months ago. Um, the bulk of what I'm going to talk about in this class is one of the few existing extant pieces of armor that we know of, um, which was a 14th century river brace. Um, there's a lot of conflicting information on where this piece is actually from. Um, it is currently believed to be uh, an English piece because of uh, where it's reported to have been found and the artwork that's actually on the piece itself. Um, but that could be in question because there's one of these in existence and I've only made the one piece. I didn't even make a matching set because, well, there's only the one piece. <laughs> uh, what I want to go ahead and do before I talk about this piece, I'm going to pass around the book so that you can see uh, one of the detailed pictures of the existing piece. Yes? The rear brace is designed basically um, it would have been worn over male which is over a uh, padded gambeson, and this piece is designed to protect the upper right arm. Um, there are lots of artwork of the time that uh, will explain the different designs and pieces of artwork on this. I will pass this piece around. The actual animals on here are known as grotesques, okay, and the uh, and in the time period, the 1400s, um, they actually had a, a spiritual or mythical connotation of um, lost souls that needed to be saved. Okay, and so it has a very religious content to it as well. Uh, this piece, Cure Belay Leather Armor, uh, there's not a real big, huge mystery to it. There are a lot of different uh, theories on how it was hardened, how it's shaped, uh, and how it's made. Uh, people have tried uh, hardening leather with wax, um, boiling water, uh, oil, and all of these things. And in practical experience, in the last 20 years of playing with it, these techniques will in fact harden the leather, but uh, there are a lot of things that will tell me from a practical side that maybe it wouldn't have been used for actual armor. Um, first off, let's talk about wax. Uh, wax will make it nice and hard, the only problem is you expose it to direct sunlight and it gets soft. Uh, and then the nice soft wax acts as a lubricant for an edge weapon to cut it. This isn't exactly what I would consider to be a desirable aspect to a piece of armor designed to protect you um, in armor combat. Uh, and then with oil, it does basically the same thing. The oils uh, will not harden the leather so much as it cooks the leather and it becomes so brittle that it loses all of its flexibility and it becomes brittle. You can actually break it with your hands. Again, this isn't really something that you want uh, for armor. Uh, there's a modern artist who does uh, leather sculptures. Is leather so durable that it can be immersed in hot liquids and cutlery, sharp knives, forks, things of that nature, don't scratch it. Um, this sounds very much like what I would want for a piece of armor. So the piece of armor that I reproduced, this reverb brace, the only thing I did to harden it was I soaked it in water, did all of the decorating tooling, shaped it, and then put it in an oven and baked it for about two hours. And when I pass the piece around, you'll see just how stiff this is, but it also retains some of its flexibility, which was one of the things that made leather armor so popular, or I believe made leather armor so popular, is that it retained its flexibility, but also had a lot of protective qualities. This piece, if you, as we pass the pictures around, this piece I tried to uh, replicate, uh, shaping it, so that it would actually fit the upper right hand arm. But it is made to the same dimensions and proportions, and the artwork is uh, reproduced to match as closely as I could of the original piece. 
Uh, a lot of folks uh, don't believe that leather can be uh, can be shaped all that readily uh, and then retain its shape. And as I pass that piece around and some of these other pieces, um, there are two theories on how it would have been shaped in period. Uh, one is to take a wooden shaped glass and to form it over the wood, nail it in place, apply the heat source to it so that it would evenly bake and dry. And that's a very uh, valid technique because you can get some really nice uh, gentle slope shapes using that method. However, the method I use, and I, uh, I have a theory on that it, uh, for armor making, is I use basically the same tools plate metal armor is used with hammers and fishing forms, which I have set up over here. And the reason why I believe that that's the case is because not only does it train the leather to stay in the shape that I want it to stay in, but it also compresses the leather, making it even more dense and difficult to, uh, to damage with edge weapons. And so basically, one of the things we're going to show I'm not going to set up any actual patterns for armoring, but I use a lot of metal hammers and that sort of thing to get some nice intricate shapes. I'll go ahead and pass her on this gauntlet. Okay, this gauntlet decidedly is not a historical reproduction. Okay, um, for the time period that leather was used as a predominant ar predominant armor source would have been somewhere between the 12th and 14th century in combat, and then by the time we get to the 15th century, in the uh, 1400s, the only time you'll see leather armor is for uh, tournament pieces, okay, when they were using rebated, uh, rebated swords or wooden wasters, things of that nature. Okay, so after, pretty much after the 14th century, they stopped using leather uh, for combat armor, and it was tournament armor. Now the only people that participated in the tournaments were noblemen and they were pretty rich. So the philosophy or the thought that leather is a poor man's armor is decidedly arguable. Since only rich people were doing that particular sport activity, leather was not actually a cheap form uh, of armor. But this gauntlet is basically based off of uh, a 14th century clam shell okay, that would have been made out of steel. Um, they definitely would not have made this out of leather. Um, basically, I came up with this design because I have a working hypothesis if it can be made out of steel, I can make it out of leather. Okay? And I, made, I came up with the gauntlet pattern just to prove that theory to myself. And then, oh, by the way, I'm also in the Society for Day of Anachronisms, and we hit each other with sticks. And this is more than adequate to protect your hands from a stick. I don't think I'd want somebody swinging a live sword at me wearing these, but with uh, a rebated sword or a wooden waster, they're very protective. Since I have a pair of them, I decide. Starting with about a 80 grand. What I've gone ahead and done uh, with a, a lot of my leather patterns, most of what I do is straight up sports equipment. For uh, rattan or wooden stick combat armor, uh, but the uh, but a lot of the pieces that I'm starting to develop are based off of actual historical pieces. This giraffe, um, if you take a look at different uh, effigies, is very feasible for the 12th century to be worn over mail and a padded gambeson. Um, Went ahead and gave it a slight uh, bulbous dish to the set, to the uh, midsection so that when you get hit, it's not directly up against your skin. And that goes ahead and uh, transfers the energy of, of the sword blow across your entire body. Couple the, the leather over top of mail and a padded gambeson, you're very well protected. Um, and the epidural evidence that I've been able to find and see uh, shows underneath the surcoats strapped cross armor um, at a time period where plate body armor we don't really have evidence that it exists on um, from what I've been able to find. 
uh, and so mother becomes a very plausible theory. A lot of new pieces that I've made have over three years. Obocons, ridiculously large bands, yes? But because it's so thick, and another reason why I don't believe this would have been done um, in history, because the material, the medium I'm using is so thick, I use uh, typically 14 ounce leather to make my armor pieces, um, which is about a quarter of an inch thick, which is much thicker than you would need for metal to do the same thing. Well, when coupled with the band brace, you notice that the fan just barely comes about an inch past the edge of the band brace so that you get just the right amount of protection for the inside of the arm, which is why the, uh, the elbow cup itself will look a little misshapen, a little bit too big. I designed it so that when worn over top of the band brace, it's the correct size. But it ends up, when looking, when looking at it by itself, it comes out looking rather large. And this piece here is based off of um, basically a Max Goyen quiz, um, minus all of the fluting. Uh, and I like the idea, uh, basically the practicality of this piece, you'll notice that it's dished out here to the side on the outside of the thigh. Um, it gives a, a nice look to the piece, but basically what, all, what it also does is again, it takes the armor itself away from the leg so that when you're struck by a blow, that energy is transferred across the piece and doesn't directly impact on your leg. But basically what I've gone ahead and done this morning was I took some leather and I soaked it in water for about four hours this morning. And I've let it case for about an hour, which is basically you allow the uh, you pull it out of the water, and you just allow the tannin fluids that are in the leather to congeal a little bit, so you get this nice malleable piece of leather. But it will also retain some of its shape. About three years ago, I was at a uh, SCA function uh, known as Gulf Wars, a very large war uh, down in Mississippi. And for about 15 minutes, I was there in the shop and I was working with this hammer and a different dish, but basically doing the same task that I'm doing now, which is shaping this into a nice little bowl. And the guy, after about 15 minutes of watching me, asked me what I was doing, and he said, and I said, uh, well, I'm dishing the leather. He said, well, you can't do that. And so I, I took the piece out of the form. I said, you're absolutely right. This is impossible. I'll set it down and I'll stop doing it. <laughs> uh, leather is very, very easy to work with. The problems that you get with it is if the leather is too wet, it's like trying to work overcooked pasta. Okay, It'll take any shape you want it to do, it, but it won't hold that shape. But by allowing allowing the leather to case for about an hour or so after it's done soaking, which gives you the time you need to do all the tooling like I did on this piece. Um, basically what you end up with is, is after you're done shaping it, it'll keep this shape as long as I don't actually slap on it, okay? It'll hold its shape, but the thing is, is now if you take a look at it, it didn't go back to being flat. Okay, because what I've done is, is I've trained the molecular structure in the leather to stay in the shape that I gave it originally. So that when you put it in the oven and apply heat to the piece, what that's going to do is it's going to take the molecular structure of the leather or, and the tannins and they're going to congeal back together and you end up with the pieces that you got to handle 
something that's going to keep that shape for a very long time uh, and becomes very protect, uh, very good for protective qualities. The problem you're going to have with this, you go ahead and pass this around, is, is now that you've cooked the leather and shaped it and done all the other things to it, what do you do to preserve it, preserve it to get it to last? Um, and that's where a lot of the theories of wax, oil, and that sort of stuff came in. And a lot of uh, reenactors have gone on to argue with me and tell me, well, leather armor obviously isn't as prevalent as you, uh, you might like to believe it is because, well, we'd see a lot more of it. Well, with all of the effigy evidence that we're starting to find and the different uh, manuscripts and illuminations and paintings of things that I personally don't believe could be anything other than uh, tooled and embossed leathers. Um, the reason why it doesn't exist anymore is, well, leathers are an organic material. Now, if you were to wax it or oil it or, some, or put some sort of preservative into it, yeah, it would probably last a little bit longer, um, but also as an organic material it would still decompose and go away. But once you've got it shaped, if you get reimmerse this in water and let it soak for a few hours, it's going to lose its shape, okay, and become very malleable again. So now this is designed to be worn in combat situations, and well, they didn't stop wars because it was raining, okay. Uh, and so something had to be done to get this so that it would keep its shape. The theory I've come up with is, and what I did with the reproduction of this rebrace, is I take natural animal fats and worked it into the leather. Um, and at first I was very leery to try that, but I thought by adding the oils back into the leather, it would make it a little bit too malleable and make it uh, very flexible, and I'd get mush again. And I was kind of scared. But what I found with this piece, just by taking natural animal fats and working it into it, I now, you can hand me that bucket of water behind you. It's dry, but it's, it's a different motion. Shake it off, and all the water runs right off. Now, I'm not going to keep it in the bucket for hours on end, but what the animal fat has done is it sealed the outside of the leather. And the other, some other tricks that they, I believe they would have done is burnishing. Okay, and basically what burnishing is is nothing more. In Korea, they would have used a bone edge slicker, um, basically made out of a rib bone or whatever. This one is made out of synthetic plastic. Um, basically the same properties, it's just not bone. Uh, but what this does, by burnishing the edges and the piece itself, while it's still wet, it gets the, uh, the leather, the pores in the leather, basically to compress and seal. And the van brace that's being passed around hasn't had any sealant put on it at all. But you can notice that there's a little bit of a sheen to it. Basically, by taking the bone edge slicker to it and just burnishing the outside edges, it'll bring the natural luster of the leather out and it polishes it up a little bit. And that also becomes water resistant. Not waterproof, but water resistant. All, yeah, all of this leather is. Um, is cowhide. Uh, I've played with other hides a little bit uh, in an attempt to make hardened leather. Um, and I believe the reason why it doesn't work all that well for me is the tanning processes for different types of hides um, just don't really lend themselves to what it is I do with leather. Um, does that mean they didn't use it? No. It just means modern techniques for tanning. Uh, for say elk or uh, pig skin 
and those types of hides just doesn't really lend itself to what it is uh, for armor quality. Also, um, having studied, studied different kinds of hides, um, they have, uh, they're more porous. And so they're um, a lot more malleable, and it's just, it's much harder to work with and get it to retain its shape. Whereas uh, cowhide just really lends itself um, by, its, by its own natural properties to armor making, uh, which makes me believe that's the primary source of where they would have gotten their hides from uh, for armor in uh, period. Unfortunately, uh, I can't find any period recipes on how they actually harden armor. I can find recipes on uh, how to make water bottles and drinking vessels and how they waterproof uh, jack boots and how they made book covers and all sorts of other mundane uh, everyday uses. But I can't find any techniques anywhere um, on how they would have hardened armor. Um, but then again, also if you take a look at uh, different plate mail sources and that sort of thing, we have the, the existing, the extant pieces, but we don't have any record, written record as to how they made. We've got a bunch of tools, we got a bunch of extant pieces, but we don't have any written record. And I think uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the reason for that is is the, the trade secrets were kept very very well uh, for all sorts of armor. Uh, now, would leather armor have been made by an armorer in history? I really don't think so. Um, has been shown in uh, Garninger and the other discussions. Um, there are very quite a few different guilds involved in the process of making armor, and they didn't really uh, it didn't all happen in the same shop. And what did happen in the same shop didn't all happen didn't all get made by the same person. Uh, I personally believe that uh, individual leather pieces, if they were commissioned for armor. They would have been farmed out to a leather craftsman uh, who doesn't primarily know anything about armor, he just knows how to craft leather. And so what would end up happening is he'd go ahead and he'd decorate it and give you what you wanted on the decorative piece, and then he would have to work hand in hand with the armor on what shape you wanted. And then he'd go ahead and he'd fashion that piece for you. Um, now, this piece, this rear, rear brace, I didn't bother painting or gilding, um, and again, the only finishing I used for it was the, uh, the animal uh, fat, because the original piece that I have pictures of, there's absolutely no evidence anywhere of paint or sizing or gilding or anything of that nature, and what I really wanted to reproduce the piece. So I only wanted to do what I had evidence of. But if you take a look at all the artwork of the time, they loved color. So I started playing around with painting leather. How would you get that color? Um, all of these pieces that I have here today um, are, you, are done using modern paints, um, mostly acrylics and that sort of thing because of their uh, flexibility properties. Um, but some of the things I'm looking at is uh, painting leather with um, curry style paints. Uh, basically taking um, pigments and mixing them with different uh, ordens, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, to make the paints. Uh, egg tempura, bad idea. <laughs> um, I went ahead and I let the piece cure for the piece that I practiced and didn't bring with me because I'm very embarrassed by it. Um, I went ahead and I let it cure for two weeks before I, shot, I tried to seal it. Because of course, uh, egg tempera paint, very, very water soluble. It would have to have been sealed. I attempted to go ahead and take a high glue mixture and seal it. The egg tempera, the, the chemical reaction of the, uh, the egg itself, uh, an artist sat down and explained it to me. It actually takes about a year for the egg to completely dry. 
it's amazing. <laughs> and so it's going to react with anything that you add to it. Um, so I really don't think Egghead Perna was the way to go with painting leather armor pieces, uh, mostly because I don't think anybody would want to sit around and wait for a year for the stuff to actually dry enough before they can seal it. Yes, it does. I found that out too. <laughs> um, but it also cleans up really, really nice because when I made this nasty, gloppy mess and decided I needed to clean it up, I just ran it underneath a spigot and two minutes with no scrubbing, I had bare left. Another reason why I don't think egg tempera paint would have been used. Um, I have no idea what actually was used. Uh, I'm trying to find different uh, period methods of oil-based paints, perhaps, um, things of that nature. Because with the amount of the riot of color that you find in the artwork from the 12th through the 14th century, um, it just really lends itself to believing that all of the leather armor would have been painted as well. And all of the extant horse armor that we find from the 14th, 15th, 16th century um, all has some form of uh, mixture of gesso and paint. Okay, so we know that leather armor was painted, at least for horses, and if you're going to go through the expense and the time to paint armor and make it all pretty for your horse, they're going to do the same thing for what they were wearing. Uh, it's just a matter of finding out what works uh, on the medium. Yeah. I was going to say, what about mixing the pigment with the research or something? Is that... Gesso's a base, usually something that might be... Well, gesso is basically animal hide glue mixed with gypsum, okay, which is basically the same stuff that we use to make drywall out of. Right. Um, it cracks. It, it has no flexibility whatsoever. Um, yeah, it might have been used, and there's evidence of it having been used on um, horse cruppers, um, basically the piece of armor that goes over the, uh, the back side of the horse, his lower back and the hips. Um, but for gesso on, on body armor, I'm not sure. Some type of sealant. Painting it, painting it uh, fresco style might have worked, but then I'm not sure what they would have done to seal it. I don't know, just thoughts floating around. The much older form that I've heard of is mixed with a pigment that's in an air pack. Really? Yeah. Where'd you find it? I want to look it up. Okay. That's something I'd like to look into. But she does discuss, she does discuss um, I've had people explain to me that maybe uh, natural dyes that they used for fabric, uh, having experimented that, it, it doesn't work well at all. Uh, you don't really see the color. Uh, some of the other techniques that I wanted to show you to being able to shape leather. I've shown you a simple dish. Uh, basically, yeah, there's a piece. It is possible to flute leather. Basically, I use a cross beam hammer. Style armors. 
okay, uh, on the uh, extant piece that he has, the fluting is very gentle and almost understated. And basically, you can do the exact same thing with leather. Uh, yes? Do you notice any strengthening in the leather? Um, not particularly. <laughs> not particularly. Uh, uh, the only reason why I did it was I wanted to know if it could be done. Um, with, as with any sort of uh, material, the more folds you put in it, okay, or different shapes you give it, the stronger it makes the piece. Haven't necessarily found that to be the case with fluting of leather, but with dishing and things of that nature, it, it definitely holds true. Take, Uh, 
you would see some form of distortion and damage done to the tooling. That's not the case in this piece. In the, uh, in the detailed picture that I passed around earlier, you can see that the tooling itself maintained its shape uh, very well, which leads me to believe after 20 years of tooling and embossing leather and shaping it um, and trying it both ways, it, it, it really lends to the belief that all of the embossing and tooling would have been done with the leather still flat which also lends to the belief that it would have been farmed out to a leather worker to do the work. Um, and then maybe sent back to the armor to be stretched over the last or dish, you know, wherever the case may be. Because one of the things I found out, this piece took about 25 hours to make, um, and the tooling took about 20 hours by itself. Uh, the shaping took maybe an hour. Uh, and I drew it over a T-bar stick and into a, uh, a dishing bowl. But it is possible to case, tool, allow it to dry, recase, tool some more, and just let it 20 times this was immersed into water. So it's very probable that it was farmed out to a leather worker and then sent back to the armor for shaping. It's very impossible that that was the way it was done. Uh, again, I only baked it the one time. Um, the reason why I only baked it the one time is it being a total solid piece, if I was to put it in the oven and bake it and harden it, having only tooled one section, and then try to go back and tool it again after it's been hardened, um, Having passed the piece around, you all notice it had sort of the consistency of hardened wood. The leather embossing tools wouldn't have worked on the piece. It wouldn't, you wouldn't get the detail. What temperature did you bake it? I baked it at uh, approximately 150 degrees for about two and a half to three hours. Every 15 minutes, pulling it out of the oven to make sure I didn't over bake it and cook it. Um, did you have to bake it? No. <laughs> Well, I did preheat the oven. Yes, I did. Um, but the, uh, I have um, been known to go ahead and leave armor at 150 degrees in the oven for about two hours, and it comes out perfectly fine. Absolutely nothing's wrong with it. It's nice, it's hard, it's retained some of its flexibility, and it, it's, there's no problems with it whatsoever. And then I'll take a piece cut from the same take another piece of armor cut from the same hide, put it in the oven, and well, this piece that came from only a foot away was able to sit in the oven for two hours unwatched and it was fine. Well, this piece should be fine. I pull it out and it looks like cooked bacon. <laughs> um, the, the properties of leather vary inch to inch on the hide. Every, and there's, there is no consistency to the piece at all as far as to how it works. Um, so it takes a lot of trial and error. Um, another reason why I don't believe that immersing, the direct translation of Kerbele is leather oil. Okay, that's a direct translation. And so a lot of people believe that leather is immersed into boiling water. Out of, I guess for the last six or seven years, I've experimented with that using consistent temperatures, consistent uh, time periods of keeping the leather immersed, and I have yet to have any two pieces of leather come out with the same consistency or properties. Every single time, I get a different result. Um, man hours were free, materials were extremely expensive. I can't see them wasting that much material on trying to get one piece just so. Uh, on this, on uh, different versions of my sports armor that I've done, I've tried, uh, I've tried the boiling method, and you get the leather will swell and become thick, but then you'll get 
somewhere between 20 and 35 percent shrinkage in the actual form. And so getting it the right size so that it'll fit the person that you're making it for, um, you're not really going to be able to get that with any real consistency. So if somebody was to commission the armor for me and I took all the measurements I needed and then immersed this leather into boiling water, I've got a 20% chance of getting it right to fit him. And if it doesn't fit him and he's the person that's paying for it, well, he's not paying for it. <laughs> Uh, which is another another reason that you can believe that immersing leather in boiling water just wasn't done. Because getting a consistent result just, I have yet to be able to do it. And using a thermometer to regulate the temperature of the water and gauging how thick the leather is throughout the piece to make sure that it's all consistent in its thicknesses and that sort of thing. <clears throat> With that kind of exacting standards on trying to get consistent results, and I haven't been able to uh, over the last six years. But when I went to casing it in water and baking it in the oven, every single piece I've made, every single one of them, has come out essentially the same, with no shrinkage or, uh, or distortion and problems of that nature. Where you run into the problems with the baking method is it'll cook a little bit faster because of the consistency of the leather. And that's why I've gone to the method of checking it every 15 minutes uh, and making sure that I haven't cooked it too much. How do you know, how do you know when you're cooking too much and not enough? Uh, all right, leather when it's been cooked too much basically takes on the properties of bacon. Okay, I mean, literally. It shrivels up, um, it's very crispy on the edges, I mean, it looks burnt, um, you can crumble it with your fingers. It's uh, lost. It's become very rigid and brittle. And it's lost all of its flexibility. That's when it's been cooked too much. When it hasn't been cooked enough, you can still move it, and it's very pliable, like this piece here. Okay. When it's been cooked enough, you can't do that to it. It's become very rigid, very consistent, but it still has a little bit of natural flexibility. So let's say you just left it out. Would it eventually get harder? Yes, it would. Um, I uh, have taken uh, some leather where I've just immersed it in water, set it out in the sun to let it bake dry in the sun, and you will get very hard leather that way. Uh, that does work. Add the tiniest amount of moisture to it, and it resorts back to this state. Whereas with this piece, it's been baked dry in the oven, it gets wet and it retains its rigidity. Um, so I, I definitely believe the heat was involved. But How do you think they did that in theory? Baking it with a consistent temperature for a Because they knew how to bake bread yeah. out. Yeah, what kind of oven did they use? Um, <laughs> clay, clay ovens. Um, uh, would have been a, that would have been a good a good source. Basically, anything that you can take a pallet of wood and insert it into the oven. Um, the dome baked clay ovens work very well. I've uh, I've uh, bake hardened using that uh, with uh, letting the fire cool down to just embers and let it bake for a bit that way. Uh, and the technologies they had for the different ovens that they made back then had very good, consistent heat sources all the way around the piece. With nice, uh, I don't know the technical term, but basically convection or oven. Thank you. Convection or oven. Uh, that technology existed. Yeah. You know, so uh, of course you don't get to turn the dial to the exact heat, and that's why. The heat I use, when I, when I tell people, um, when you're experimenting with uh, hardening leather, low heat, okay? Uh, and my definition of low heat is anywhere from 150 to 200 degrees. Um, they didn't have thermometers. 
Okay, there's one of that exactitude. Uh, so the boil your water to, a, or heat your water to 180 degrees and immerse it for 30 seconds. Well, they didn't have a stopwatch to measure 30 seconds, and they didn't have a thermometer to get the exact uh, heat of the water. And so, you know, that kind of exactitude isn't really possible. Low heat in an oven for about an hour or two, yeah, that's really possible. How do you, when you put those in the oven, do you put those in the oven, the larger pieces like places or breast plates or back plates? Is the dishing casing enough for it to keep its shape, or do you have to put some, some sort um, No, of it, it's, it's fine. It's fine the way it is. So um, it's the only way we'll press it down. No, no, it doesn't. Um, this piece here, uh, I can't really demonstrate it today because, of course, I didn't bring my oven with me. Shame on me. But, uh, but basically, with just this amount of dishing, put it in the oven, let it sit, you know, 15 minutes at a time for two hours, and it'll keep this shape. Uh, every once in a while, the weather will relax a little bit. Um, so, again, when I'm checking it every 15 minutes or so, all right, well, it's this piece is relaxed out and flattened down a little bit. I'll well, we'll just tweak it back in a little bit by hand, put it back in the oven, and then once it's a little bit more dry, it keeps the shape more dry. Yes? Two questions. Uh, first, does leather tan, does the method, when you use to tan the leather, give you different results? And then the second, have you tried the process with raw hide? Okay. Um, Different types of tanning methods um, will produce. All right, let me see if I can remember the technical terms of this. I'm not very well footprinted, but uh, vegetable tanning, okay, basically um, tree bark or things of that nature, okay, create tannin acids, which uh, go ahead and tan the leather. Tanning. Uh, vegetable tanning is basically the only kind of, in my opinion, the only term that I can actually call tanning. Everything else is cured. Okay. Uh, if you use brain matter to cure the leather, uh, basically the uh, brain of the animal, and rub that into the surface, that's curing. If you soak it in oil, um, like latigo, that's curing. Uh, rawhide, on the other hand, Nothing's done to it at all, other than to stretch it out and allow it to just cure completely raw, okay, which is where the term rawhide comes from. Um, rawhide will form very well um, by soaking it in water and that sort of thing, but the other the problem with using rawhide is uh, it, uh, it doesn't retain its shape at all once you get it wet, it resorts back to its natural form of just uncured hot. Um, other types of curing um, with oil or brain matter, things of that nature, uh, makes the leather very supple. Again, it doesn't lend itself to hardening very well. Um, vegetable tanning works the best. Yes. You know what tanning it in shape. Tanning it in shape. In other words, doing all your work to it before it's tanned. I don't know if anybody's tried that or not. I know I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an interesting theory. If you're, if you're boiling it or if you're somehow raising the temperature during the tanning process, if you can then have a little bit of that. I don't know. That's interesting. You gave me something else to play with. I think the tanners and the uh, leather workers are a different guild, so yeah. probably not.
experimented with any other louder sellers using the acrylic process? Um, Acrylic process or the dyeing process? Okay, with dyeing, I found that um, first off, I use Feebling Better Dye. It's a straight dye, basically alcohol based. Uh, blue, yellow, red, oxyblood, brown, all the different shades of brown, and black. All of those work very well. If you do the cooking process, like boiling water or things of that nature, it darkens it. And so the darker colors don't work all that well. Bake, baking it doesn't change the color at all. And so I personally prefer that because blue doesn't come out looking like black, red doesn't come out looking like black, green doesn't come out looking like black.